All right, everybody, welcome back to Ultrasound Grand Rounds this week. It's been a few weeks. Uh, it's been a few weeks that we haven't have met here, largely because February's been a busy, busy month. I've got a couple boys who've had a couple birthdays. I mean, one each, um, but between the two of them, we had two birthdays to celebrate, which took some time away. Uh, and so we just haven't had a lot of time to, to do the teaching that we've been doing this month, but we're getting back at it. We're coming back strong this uh, spring. I was going to about to say fall, but it's, it's this spring uh, with more excellent ultrasound education. So today we had a guest speaker planned who unfortunately was not able to join us today um, for, for today's Grand Rounds. So I've asked Dr. Sandy Werner to, to present today. And so she graciously, last minute, pulled something out and is going to be talking to us a little bit about um, an interesting topic, uh, one that we've briefly explored here before, but I am so excited to hear Sandy's expertise on this one. Uh, she's going to be talking about testicular ultrasound and how we can use the ultrasound at the bedside to help us with patients with acute scrotal pain. So without further delay, I'm going to turn things over to Sandy and let's hear what you have to say. Oh, boy. <laughs> Thanks for the handoff, Matt. Yes, I know most of you who saw the the invitation were expecting something on, you know, cognitive bias and ultrasound. So we're going to have a little cognitive dissonance here as I proceed with testicular ultrasound. Um, so we'll go ahead and, and get started. So we're basically going to talk about the anatomy of the testicles, the scanning technique, typical ultrasound appearance, the twisted tors um, uh, testicle, the infected testicle, and the traumatized testicle, some various seals and hernias and tumors and some other interesting findings that we might have. So the testicular anatomy, according to the textbook, uh, well, you have the spermatic cord and you have the testicular artery and the pampiniform plexus, which is venous. And that's important when we start talking about varicose seals. Um, and then notice that there's also a cremasteric artery. And that's important because if you're looking for flow and you think you're seeing it, but it's only around the periphery, you're seeing it from the wrong artery. So then we have into the head of the, epi hep head of the epididymis, which is typically um, you know, less than 12 millimeters, and then down to the tail, where it's quite small. It could be like two to, two to four millimeters. So you may not even see that as you're scanning a normal testicle. Uh, you'll see um, the uh, reedy testes. That's going to be a slightly hyperechoic uh, space in the testicle. And then the septa, which the, all of that is going to appear homogeneous. And then you have the tunica albuginic, albuginia and then the tunica vaginalis. So the technique. Well, this, the scrotum needs to be supported, usually by towels. The patient is supine. Um, if you don't have towels, you can try a basket. Um, the linear frequency, because obviously these are quite superficial. And then warm gel, because everybody knows that if you have a cold testicle, it's going to run away and retreat because there's this, this um, very nice muscle that, that retracts it. And trying to find a testicle in the abdomen is just a little bit difficult to do. So we want it nice and warm. And typically you start with the unaffected testicle so that you are not um, scanning the painful one first. And no cold gel. I'm not sure what ice power gel is, but there it is. Um, not, none of that. So the scanning planes, we're going to scan in sagittal and transverse and typically work from the outside in. So we're going to start, this is the unaffected testicle, start sagittal and start on the uh, lateral aspect, the, me the uh, midline, and then the medial. And then we'll do the same thing for the other testicle. And then the transverse views, we can start at the top and work down on each testicle. And then here's the money shot. This is the buddy shot where you'll actually be able to compare the two testicles. So you'll be able to see both in grayscale and with color flow, how they compare to each other. So the sonographic anatomy, you know, we got this great picture on the right with all these little pieces, parts. Um, and really what we, what we tend to see is the, um, at the very top of the screen is actually the ultrasound gel, which you can see. And then uh, the scrotal sac and then the testicle. Um, and you can see the reedy testes down on the left. And you can't even, in this view, you can't really even see the epididymal head. And the testicle usually is about four uh, centimeters in length and two to four centimeters in width and probably um, three to five, three to four centimeters in uh, breadth. 
And then this is just an example of the appearance of the normal testicle on the right, very homogeneous. And then as you scan a little more superiorly, you'll see the epididymal head. And that also looks pretty homogeneous and it's slightly separated from the testicle. There's also the mediastinum testes. This is a bright white line that's that's um, you'll see in the middle of the testicle, particularly on the short axis view. And this is completely normal. So if you see this long calcification in the testicle um, within the parenchyma, it's completely normal. And here's the money shot. So you have the right testicle and the left testicle, and you can compare and see if they look the same. So if you have um, something like uh, some mass or torsion uh, that's been going on for a while, you'll see some difference in the echogenicity. It's also the money shot for looking at Doppler. So we're going to look at flow in the testicles. This is super important, particularly when you're looking for torsion. So you can compare the flow in the right and the left testicle. So you can also put spectral Doppler on there, which can be can be really important because remember the testicle, in order to be completely tors, it actually has to go around 450 degrees. So we're talking greater than, you know, it's like spin halfway, spin halfway, and spin halfway again, and even almost another round before you completely cut off the flow. So we're going to want to look at the flow and compare it with the other testicle. So typically the arterial flow, which is shown on the left side, it's a, it's a pretty high flow and low resistance. So the testicle is getting, um, sorry, it's a low flow, but low resistance. So the testicle is getting blood pretty much all of the time. Um, it doesn't have a lot of resistance. It doesn't go through a period where it's, it's kind of getting a shot of blood and then no blood. And then the venous flow appears as just kind of a, you know, as you would think of the venous flow in, in uh, like if you're looking at a DVT and you put, put spectral Doppler on it, it kind of has an intermittent uh, phasicity to it. And so typically we put color flow on it and this is our, our regular color flow and we don't see any color. And you're like, oh, it's tors, it's tors. But remember, the testicle has really low flow. So if we don't see anything with our typical Doppler, you're going to move on to color power Doppler. So you'll notice that the, the scale, it goes from yellow to darker orange. It doesn't measure the direction of the flow. It just measures the strength of the flow. And this is a super useful modality for low flow organs. So we commonly have to go to this on testicles um, that are, are pretty normal. Now, if somebody has orchitis, it typically sort of lights up like a Christmas tree, but, but somebody with normal flow, we may very well have to go to the color Doppler to get the flow. And actually, if you put the spectral on top of that, you can tell which direction and whether it's arterial or venous. So moving on to the big number, testicular torsion. Um, <laughs> I particularly like this testicle. The, the right testicle is standing by pretty helpless. The ultrasound probe is pressing on the very unhappy tors testicle. And so what happens is the um, testes and the spermatic cord gets uh, twisted and you wind up with an ischemic testicle, which is very, very unhappy. And the reason this happens, the primary reason this happens is because of the testicle being not anchored by the, um, the tunica vaginalis. In a normal tunica vaginalis, it, vaginalis, it ends at the, um, the most caudal portion of the testicle and it anchors it there. But you can have this bell clapper deformity where the tunica vaginalis, this purple, um, the purple um, area on the, on the ultrasound, uh, doesn't doesn't connect right to the testicle. It actually envelopes the whole thing. And then the testicles are kind of allowed to lie down. Um, so you get this bell clapper deformity where it's 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 free, it's loose. So you can actually tors it by just moving a certain way. You can actually get torsion by trauma. Um, and you can see how the vessels, the arteries and the veins will get torsed and cut off the blood supply. And there's actually two peaks of torsion um, it's at two months and also at 20 years. So typically later adolescence is when we see it. Um, it's less common. There's a little bump at two months, but there's a much larger bump in late adolescence. 
And one of the things you want to do when you're looking at these, if you have one that's torsed, is look to see if the other one has that same lie. So it would be a perpendicular rather than a vertical lie within the scrotal sac. Um, so that's an example, typical onset, sudden pain. Um, you may have an absent cremasteric reflex that usually takes a little time to develop. And, and typically what will happen is first you'll see your venous flow go away and then the arterial. If you get to this in within six hours, the salvage rate is 80 to 100%, but it really, really drops. It's about 50% at 12 hours and uh, down to 20% or less if it's 24 hours. Um, so it's really imperative that these are identified and um, uh, treated really quickly. So the sensitivity of ultrasound for torsion is very high. Um, partial torsion, so this is somewhat operator dependent. Um, so you have to be able to use the, the um, spectral Doppler and understand it and convince the urologist based on your reading that it truly is partially torsed. And again, you don't lose complete loss of blood flow until it's really, really well torsed. You can also have this phenomenon called intermittent torsion, where it's torsed and then it gets detorsed either partially or all the way. So they won't have pain while it's detorsed and they will have pain while it's torsed. And the ultrasound with that can be kind of strange because it may actually appear hypervascular. The affected testicle may appear hypervascular in periods where it is not torsed. So it might actually look like an orchitis. So the, the history taking there is really important. So the grayscale findings in torsion, well, you know, it really depends on how long it's been torsed. If it's only been torsed for 20 minutes, they're going to look about the same. So you really cannot use grayscale alone to rule in or out testicular torsion. So you really do need this, this uh, color element to it. Um, so usually pretty normal, normal, and then it will progress to becoming larger and hypoechoic compared to the other testicle. And sort of the, the normal testicular echogeni echogenicity is a pretty good predictor of whether the testicle is viable. If you put the transducer on and it's big and it's really heterogeneous, the likelihood that that testicle can be salvaged is approaching zero. So early torsion in Doppler, um, so it's the absence of flow on color in power Doppler um, is considered diagnostic. Two provisos though provided the machine settings are correct, which is why you need your buddy view, and provided the torsion is complete, and you still need your buddy view there because you're going to actually, actually have to compare the, the nature of the flow. So what happens, this is our normal spectral Doppler flow again, and you can see that the, the um, it's a low resistance arterial form. There's lots of flow going on even in diastole. And so, and there's venous flow. The first thing you'll lose is the venous flow. It will simply go away. It'll be like, I can't find it. And then the next thing that might happen is that your arterial flow will start to look high resistance. So you're gonna have higher, um, higher peak velocities. And then you'll notice that there's periods during diastole where there is no flow going on. And if it's completely torn, uh, torsed, you may actually see some retrograde flow during the diastolic phase. So again, super important to, to be able to use um, your spectral Doppler on this. So um, we talked about this already. Um, and then torsion, again, it's either decreased or absent flow. Venous goes first, arterial goes second. Increased resistive index, which is why you see that there are you, there's no blood flow or much less blow much much less flow during um, di di diastole, um, and then the decreased velocity velocity in the arterial flow. So. Um, a couple of other signs you might see. This is from UCSD, and it's a nice picture of the whirlpool sign. I sort of tend to think of this as the circling the drain sign, because um, <laughs> you know where this testicle is going. But it's actually the twisting of the spermatic cord and the vessels that you're seeing. And it looks kind of like a whirlpool if you put color on it. And even without color, it looks like a whirlpool or 
you know, it's circling the drain. Um, so, and this is why it looks that way. You can see the normal anatomy. And then once everything is tors, you get these, the vessels, the veins and the arteries look like they're a whirlpool. So late torsion, the testicle becomes hypoechoic and it usually becomes enlarged and very heterogeneous. Um, and then um, with chronic, it can actually become hypoechoic. And I want you to notice that the image in the, the upper right has some flow around it, but take a careful look at that. The flow is actually, it's either artifact or it's not actually within the testicle. So you have to be careful and not think, oh, there's some flow. And when you're really looking at the, the um, scrotal sac around the testicle. Okay, we're doing something weird. Okay. This is an image of late torsion, again, really enlarged. Um, and you'll notice the reedy testes has kind of separated and become hypoechoic. And then there's areas within the testicle that look infarcted, like in the upper right side of it. You can see there's an area that looks kind of infarcted. Next slide. And then with, with torsion detorsion, we talked about this a little bit, that there's pain and pain-free intervals. And if, if it's scanning while they're pain-free, it may demonstrate increased flow. So um, that can be a tricky thing to, to, um, to accommodate in just ultrasound. So you have to really, really listen to the history um, because infection is usually sort of indolent. It starts slowly as opposed to torsion that's going to be rapid onset. There are some other conditions that can result in decreased blood flow too. So obviously if your technical setup isn't correct, the pediatric population, just because of the small testicles, it can be difficult to find the flow. If you have a hydrocele or a hematoma, that can actually compress the vessels and lead to, to decreased flow. If you have an inflama inflammatory process like vasculitis, that can do it as well. If you have really a um, lot of scrotal edema, so your ultrasound beam is really not getting to, the, to um, penetrate to your testicles, you may actually have to switch to a, um, a curvilinear transducer in that case. And then, of course, if you've had an orchitis or a trauma and the, the um, testicle has infarcted, there won't be any blood flow because it's dead. So moving on to infectious processes. So epididymitis and orchitis, those lead to increased flow of, in the affected testicle. So torsion, decreased flow, infection, increased flow. And you have a, if you have a peak systolic velocity of greater than 15 centimeters um, per second, that's 93% diagnostic for epididymitis. And I don't know the same correlation for orchitis, but typically you see epididymitis first and then it progresses to orchitis. And you can actually see uh, scrotal abscesses and cellulitis and fourniers can be identified through ultrasound as well. So here you can see the, um, an example of orchitis. And again, our settings are the same on the machine. So we're looking at the right and the left, and you can see that there's hypervascularity within the left testicle. So that's an example of, of orchitis. It's not a rip-roaring orchitis um, like this one is. You know, you put the, <laughs> you put the probe on and, and you're like, whoa, blinded by the light. Um, so that would be that would be a pretty pretty nasty orchitis, and you know we typically see epididymitis and orchitis um, in the younger sexually active population. And as you know, the antibiotic treatment is different for those folks. And then when you get into the older population, where it's more likely caused by um, E. coli rather than STIs, um, you'll want to be treating with a different antibiotic. So keep in mind the age of your patient. So this is a nice example of epididymitis, and you can see hypervascularity in the epididymis, and you can also actually see, so the epididymis and then curving around to the body and the tail because it's so dilated, and that's normally something on, on grayscale. You really do not see the epididymis well, um, but when it's inflamed like this, you can see it, and of course, if you put color flow on it, it will light up. Um, you can have both epididymal and orchitis. So you have an epididymal orchitis. So you have hypervascularity in both the epididymis and the testicle itself. And you can actually get to where you have testicle abscesses. And typically, 
they're going to be just like any other abscess. They're going to have really irregular boundaries. They're going to be mixed echogenicity. And there's one abscess with the purple circle, and there's actually a second one forming above it. And typically, if you put flow on these, you'll see that the, the flow around them is pretty hypervascular. But unless there's some vessel directly in the abscess, you won't have a lot of flow or any flow within the abscess. And this is just another example of an abscess. There's actually kind of two abscesses, one down in the inferior portion or in the far field, and then it's kind of spreading up into the near field. So abscesses are not a good thing and they need to be surgically attended to. Um, and then the big bad thing that we all worry about, sub-Q air. So you're going to, um, you, have, you think you have a scrotal, scrotal cellulitis um, and it's kind of blown off and everybody says, well, it's just a thickened scrotum. I'm not worried about it. And you put the ultrasound on and you can't find the testicles. And you see this dirty shadowing that you see up here, which is air. So that would be air within, you know, it's kind of here's your, here's your sub-Q tissue and then you're getting within the scrotum and there's air. So that is Fournier's gangrene until proven otherwise. And you're going to start antibiotics and get your surgeons involved and they might want a CT um, but at least you will have gotten the antibiotics on board. So we're going to move on to trauma. Um, so, you know, balls and balls don't really go together um, because bad things happen to the testicular type. Um, so <laughs> you can see they can actually become fractured. So there'll be a cleft like through the, the um, testicle itself with no blood flow. And then there can be a hematoma. Um, and then you can get a hematocele. So your hematoma down here, and you can see how heterogeneous this is. It's just complete, complete mess. Um, you have a hematoma and then you actually have a hematocele. So you have um, a collection of blood that really hasn't started to, to layer out yet. So it's just nice and, and um, nice and anechoic and it's within the scrotal sac, um, but not necessarily within the testicle. So this is just a nice example of um, some scrotal trauma. And interesting, if you notice on the upper portion of the screen, the tunica albuginica, albuginia, I'll say this right by the end of the lecture, is actually disrupted. And that's a sign of a testicular rupture. So you can have trauma without a rupture, but you can also have it with a rupture. So you get a big hematoma and then you have to look hard to see if there's any rupture in the wall. Um, normally, especially if there's rupture, they're going to take it to the OR and see if they can salvage at least part of the testicle. And then this is another nice example of a testicular rupture, um, which is the red arrow. So you can see the tunica albugin albuginia <laughs> is um, completely raised from the scrotal sac. And then there's a really nice hematoma that's starting to get some um, layering and septation in it. And then the scrotal, the scrotum, the testicle itself and the epididymis are like scrunched up into um, the lower part of the testicle. So not a happy situation. And that seems to be a blank slide. Oh, so we're moving on to some other interesting findings. So a lot of times you'll see various cysts. And they can be an epididymal cyst where they're right next to the epididymis, but they're actually outside of the testicle. And just like any other cyst, if they're nice and anechoic, plain appearing, they're, they're benign. You don't have to worry about a cyst. You can also have a testicular cyst, and these can be of any size. They're typically, if they're benign, they'll have the same characteristics. They'll have posterior enhancement. They'll be round. They'll be simple without septations. Um, without anything vascular in them, um, and you know, nice and anechoic. So benign cysts, this one's a pretty large one. They come in a much smaller um, version as well. And then you can also have fluid around the testicle. So this is a nice example of a hydrocele. You can see the testicle, and then you can see a bunch of fluid, and somewhere out there is the scrotal sac. Um, but you can actually see the testicle and, and a... Um, um, the, the scrotal sac on the inferior portion. So next to it is a hydrocele that actually has some septations in it. So not quite, not quite as, as um, simple fluid, but this is typically going to be benign as well. And then kind of an important seal is a varicocele. 
And the reason these happen is because the veins get engorged. And the problem with this is that can, it can actually cut off flow, but it can also really decrease um, fertility. So this happens, it's most often on the left because the blood flow is straight down and straight up. It doesn't go um, through any artery or any um, other venous structure. It just goes straight to um, the IVC. And what it looks like is, is the, the vessels are, they look kind of wormy. So you'll see these wormy appearing vessels. And when you put flow on them, you'll see that they have nice flow on them. So it's not the whirlpool sign. It's just the hypervascularity um, around the testicle, typically above it. But these can become quite large and they can actually compress the testicle and cause an infarct or infertility. Some other things you can see, um, this is the testicle up here. And this is, well, it's kind of got some air in it. I don't think this is a video. No, I wish it were. Um, and you might see there's a nice, nice wall to it. It's got some air. It's got some heterogeneous stuff in it. You might actually see it peristalsing, which is sort of a good sign because it means the hernia is alive. If you don't see it peristalsing, that's kind of worrisome because they can actually become incarcerated um, down there. And, um, and that's, uh, that's a surgical emergency. So folks who have, and this would be the indirect type of hernia, so not straight through the wall, it's actually going through the canal. Um, folks with this type of hernia need to be seen. Um, it's usually, these are the ones that need to be repaired fairly soon, just because they're not very, you know, a, a direct hernia can become very large, and then they're really super easily reduced. But these indirect ones, the, you know, the canal is not very big. So they, they typically, you can have quite a bit of intestine in there, but the opening is fairly small. So these need to be tended to um, rather quickly. And then you can have other weird little findings in the area of the testicle. You can have scrotal lifts. These are also called scrotal pearls. And they can be, they can, they can be like next to the testicle, in the testicle, floating around in a hydrocele. They can be by the epididymis. They're very strange little creatures. The good thing is that they're benign, and so if you see them, no worries. You can also have little stones within the testicles, and having a few of these is sort of no big deal. But if you have a bunch of them, they need to be followed because there is an increased incidence of cancer when you have a bunch of microliths. So this is an example of a cancer with a um, you know, bunch of microliths surrounding it. And testicular tumors will vary greatly depending on what type of tumor they are. So some of them are going to appear hypoechoic, some of them will appear hyperechoic, some of them will have um, lots of vascularity, and some of them will have far less vascularity. So if you notice this while you're ultrasounding a scrotum, if you notice any abnormality and a heterogeneous area of the scrotum, even if it's benign or that, you know, they came in and said, hey doc, I got a lump on my scrotum, um, on my testicle, and, and you look at it and you see an abnormality, um, something that's, that's, uh, that disrupts the homogeneity of the tissue, this is something that you would want to make sure they get early referral to um, to, uh, to radiology and urology. Um, you know, this isn't always, I had a patient I scanned and it turned out to be somehow there was a hematoma in there for some reason and it wasn't a tumor, um, but at least I got them to the right place. So um, summary for ultrasound. Basically what we're doing in the emergency is mostly a limited ultrasound to evaluate for acute torsion and also for signs of infection, because those are the two things that we can actually treat in the emergency department. So some other things, you may see the hydroceles, the varicoceles. The varicoceles are important to be referred to urology um, for follow-up, because that can actually be, they, they can actually be, be minimized. Hernias, again, you might need to get uh, um, quick surgical referral, especially if there's no peristalsis, they're painful, the scrotal sac is red, um, the patient is having vomiting, um, you'd be very worried that it's incarcerated and strangulated. And then you can also see some cysts, some masses, um, some, uh, you might run across a tumor. And the big message is, you know, radiology referral for additional scanning for anything you find that you don't recognize 
um, in your your sort of normal scrotal pathology.